Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, planning board meeting for Northampton today, September 26, 2024. We're here both at live at council chambers and also online through Zoom. Um, this meeting's being recorded. Uh, we will take comments. You know, you can send comments regarding any of these applications up until 4 p.m. Um, to the planning office staff. And you can also speak up during this hearing, either here in council chambers or online. Uh, traditionally, we call on people during public comment in city council chambers first, and then we move to the folks who are with us through Zoom. Um, and before we open the meeting, there's two items on the agenda today. There's a hearing at 105 Straw Avenue for a second detached dwelling. And there's also a, a public hearing on oh, housekeeping changes to the zoning, zoning ordinance at 720. And we also have a, uh, uh, another application that was continued from prior week on a preliminary subdivision at 171, 187 King Street. So other than those three items, if anyone would like to make a comment um, to the planning board about other items in the city um, or that uh, anything really, you're welcome to. Please come up and just out of protocol, we ask you to uh, uh, tell us your street, your name and your street. Hi, I'm Adam Novit and I live at 17 Hooker Avenue. Um, I think that this is the right place for this, um, but not very sure. Um, so anyways, here it goes. Uh, so I wondered how we wound up with the situation we're in with 171 King Street. Um, I wondered why anybody would buy that lot at the full asking price, given the slump of uh, pricing in commercial real estate. Yet, according to Northampton GIS, uh, those lots were purchased for a total of $5.25 million. Um, I've asked around and the purchase, I've asked around and purchase contingencies are pretty normal uh, condition in expensive real estate transactions. They could, have been, they could have used an option to purchase based on planning approval. This would have protected Ms. Consenzi from the situation we're in now, but apparently she didn't avail herself of that. I'm pretty sure there wasn't a massive line forming behind her to buy those properties. Now we're in a situation where Ms. Consenzi is blaming everyone else, the city first and foremost, but also citizens who come to express their opinions. Sam Taylor was quoted in the Gazette at the last meeting as saying, the idea that you have a business that made a business decision and someone changes the rules out from under them is just gross. If I were a bar owner and purchased a property on Crescent Street with the intention of locating a bar there, that certainly would not be a reason for the city to allow me to place a bar there. Doing so would create a double standard, one set of zoning, for business, for business owners and another set for the people who work for them. There was one set of zoning ordinances for everyone. When the zoning changed, the city shut off an option for a small scale lot like the old Pleasant Journey, which was located in the city's other gateway district along Pleasant Street. The franchise scale Volvo dealer would not have been allowed, in my understanding, <clears throat> um, in the gateway district if that had been allowed to happen. So here we are, Tommy Carr is illegally parking stored cars at 171 King. There is still the endless setting off of car alarms, and they're still blaming everyone but themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Right. It was the appropriate place. I'm not sure it's the appropriate time, but we appreciate your comments. Thank you. Anyone else would like to make a comment? Not about the three items on the agenda. I think that was leaked very close to being one of the items on the agenda. Okay, good. We'll, you'll have plenty of time during the hearing to talk about that. Anyone else? All right. Is there anyone out in Zoom who would like to raise their hand or jump up and down and let us know you'd like to speak? Seeing none, we'll move to our first item, which is a continuation without opening from August 22nd 2024, a site plan for a second detached dwelling by Willem Sistema Sitzma at 105 Straw Avenue, Florence Map ID 17D-021. And the permit number is LU-2428. And this is a site plan review 
We need a simple majority of four or seven members. So does the applicant have a presentation for us? Yes. Come on up. All right. Do I need to press this button or anything? It's green. Uh, it's, green. For, yeah. it's green now. All right. Sorry about the, okay. All right, so my name is Willem Seitzma. Um, I'm the homeowner uh, at 105 Straw Ave in Florence. Um, and I'm just gonna present um, this project of a second detached dwelling unit um, in, in our backyard. Um, so first off, uh, these are my folks. Um, they're moving from their house up in Maine, which they just sold, and they're coming down to live behind um, my wife and I. Um, and so that's that's the plan. So we're we're um, going to be doing this ADU in our backyard. Um, and we've been uh, working with backyard ADUs um, for the project. Um, they have been taking on the design and putting together the permit set for us. Um, and then the plan is to have them build the foundation um, which we're going to be building on piers um, and do the utility installation. Um, and then the sewer pump tank as well. Um, and then we are going to take on the actual building scope of the project. Um, and we're going to be doing stick built as opposed to the prefabricated building, which um, backyard ADUs usually does. Um, and the reason for that is partially the cost um, mostly due to inaccessibility for the crane to get in there. Um, so, and then also minimizing environmental impact of the project, um, and then easier to get materials to the back, um, with the limited access. Um, and then we'll be doing the finishing work and then contracting, um, the utility, sorry, the plumbing and electric, um, and at any point, if I if there's any question or anything, please let me know, or if I'm going too fast. Um, so project details: it's a single dwelling that's 702 square feet he heated area, and the footprint is 768 square feet. Um, it's one bedroom, uh, detached. So I'm just having a hard time seeing. There we go. Um, one bedroom detached second dwelling unit with its own entry. Um, it would be heated and cooled entirely by a mini split um, heat pump system. And then the proposed additional parking space would be in front of the original or the existing dwelling um, garage adjacent to the existing spot in front of the garage. Um, and I just put this location map just to give you an idea of where where it's that little red rectangle. Can you see the mass? Well, it is. Yeah. Hmm. well, it's the red rectangle there on Straw Ave. Um, and then in the existing condition, um, the lot itself is 60 feet by 160 feet. Um, and so we were going, the, we're proposing to put the ADU um, as far back as possible on the lot. So, um, you know, keeping it within the setbacks. Um, so the lot kind of slopes back as you get to the, the east, east end of the lot. And then it would be kind of like nestled back there. Um, this kind of shows this uh, picture shows how the utilities would be hooked up. Um, as you can see on the 
bottom right, that's the um, proposed see pump tank for the sewer. Um, and then that would pump um, sewage up into our existing sewage, which comes, oh, you can see the mouse, here we go. Yeah, it would come up to right here where our existing sewage leaves. Um, and then water would come in right here through the existing building and then come back along here to the ADU um, and the electric, I think the electric wiring would come through here as well. And there would be a, a separate, um, what is that, 200 and amp shut off at the ADU. Mm -hmm. um, and I I need to clarify with backyard ADUs, they did the, the design for this, but I can't remember if we would have our own circuit board um, we would have a second circuit board in, in our basement or if the second circuit board would be at the ADU, but I believe it's in our basement. It would be in here. It would be in the ADU? Okay, no, that makes sense. I also, I'm not exactly, I'm very, very sure you're not allowed, the homeowner is not allowed to build their own key by code. You have to build a license. You can build on your own house. You can't build me. That has to be done with Chris CFL. Okay. But that's yeah. beyond, but you no, that, that. that will be clarified at the building department. Yeah. Yes. I'm just yeah, no, that's I appreciate that. I I do have a good friend who's a general contractor. Don't say um, that out loud. Don't say that out loud. Okay. <laughs> you are not allowed to build things under license. Okay. Um, well, I'll continue then to the parking. <laughs> uh, so this is just kind of like a close up of the parking situation because we're required to have an additional parking space. So it's going to be adjacent to the other parking spot in front of the garage. Um, and I, like I have a few images from the, from the plans that we were, uh, given by backyard ADUs. I don't know if, if anyone has any specific questions about them. I can go go through some of the images. Um, but the building is a 32 by 24 foot structure. And I don't know if I, let's see, wanted to point out as well that it's going to be on piers. I think I mentioned that briefly, but <laughs> the idea is to, to have the structure on piers to minimize like bringing concrete to the backyard, easier to, to bring back there, so. And the port we see in this illustration is facing the back of your house? This is facing the back. Yeah. What is um, walking access like? How when somebody parks at the front, how where do they go on the site to get back to the ADU? Is there a, a pathway or a walkway um, of some kind proposed, and where is it? Yeah, that's it. Would go along along the left side of the existing house, and then we'll do. Um, I know that we. I know it's in the it's in the plans. I I'd have to kind of like refer to the plans, um, but uh, I think they were suggesting like a crushed stone pathway back, kind of like looping around the the yard. I don't know. So kind of on the top of from the orientation we were looking at. Yeah. So so this is a good screen to look at. So the pathway would would come around this way. There's currently a gate right here. Um, so it would come through that and then around like this. I think you're familiar with our, our lighting ordinances. You're not expecting to do anything 
speak about lighting there either for the pathway or the house at this point um i'm not right i'm not familiar with that but it certainly would bring it up with backyard adus and okay. talk to them about Good. that the lighting ordinances yeah There, you're not disturbing. Uh, there's a few small trees in the corner where you're going to be building. I think they're hemlocks, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, and they're going to remain there. They are. I think so. There's one, a small hemlock. So this is a maple. There's a small hemlock right here that we probably need to cut a few branches back on. But aside from that, all the trees would would stay. So we'll be looking for some kind of plan, probably um, before you start building, um, to protect those trees that okay. you're in, that aren't being removed um, during construction. Okay, I don't know if you've talked to staff about that. Um, I think I noted it to, I, I was communicating actually with um, backyard ADUs, but there is a 24 inch maple and a 28 inch beech that's located on the plan. And so those, um, per the site plan requirements, would have to have tree protection before you begin work mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because those are noted as, and those would be considered uh, significant trees um, to be protected during construction. And we'll list that as one of our kind of conditions when we get to that point. Other questions for the board before we open it to the public? All right, hearing none, is there anyone here in council chambers who would like to speak in regarding this application? Is there anyone there in uh, on our hybrid portion of the meeting in Zoom who would like to speak to this? Should you raise hands? No. All right. Please come up to the podium. Hello. Yes. I just would like to note that I think maybe plans of this nature could be re reviewed administratively, that they don't necessarily, if they're small and low impact and adding a single unit to a single family property, don't need to come all the way to planning board for site plan review. Yes. My name is Danny McCon. Thanks for your recommendation. It's part and parcel of the zoning now. So at some point that zoning would have to be looked at and amended. <clears throat> Any other questions from the board for the applicant? Should we think about closing the public meeting? Does the applicant have any questions? I don't, but I think any any of those requests that if they could just be like emailed to me or or be submitted on the the website, um, that would be great. Great. Yeah. Should I end the screen share here? Sure. The other thing we'll probably do too is um, not ask for a full blown traffic study as we're only adding a small unit here and. So we will include a waiver of that traffic study or acknowledge that it's not necessary in this, given the, given both your parents would be riding bicycles all the time. <laughs> move the close, uh, move the close the, what am I closing? Thank you. Thank you. Pat. Second. Motions were made to close public comment um, by Sam, seconded by Jana White. Any discussion? All those in favor? I unanimous. Okay. So I think we just have those two conditions or not. I think the one about the, the, the traffic isn't a condition. I think we just have the one condition about having an arbor straw plants to protect those trees. Can't think of it. I move to approve this project on straw Ave with the condition of tree protection prior to construction and uh, waiving the traffic mitigation fee. I second. Great, thank you. Motion is made by Chris Tate, seconded by Jana White. Any discussion? All those in favor? You've done good.
All right. Right on time. Thank you. Good luck with your project. <clears throat> All right, 720. We're going to open a public hearing on a package of housekeeping changes to the zoning ordinance. This was published on 912 and 919. Carolyn, do you want to give us a little overview or intro? Um, so what's in front of you are many little um, edits to the zoning ordinance to um, essentially clarify language that either internal staff was having was grappling with not quite sure about interpretation or the public um or and they also these also include some um modifications that were intended to be um adopted but slipped through the cracks um during other uh, major <clears throat> package changes and in some cases um they, the modifications were intended to um, uh, apply across the board, but when it got to the e-code, which is the electronic, um, the company that runs our online zoning code, um, it wasn't clear enough for them to include, so we have to go back and just clean those up. So I can run through all of them um, quickly. And then what the process is, so anytime there's a, there's a zoning amendment, it gets introduced as a council and then referred out for public hearing to both city council subcommittee of legislative matters and the planning board. Legislative matters is taking this up on Monday. Actually, they had to bump their regular meeting um, because of conflicts pre earlier in the month. And then, so once you review this, it will go to um, legislative matters. They'll make a determination about these and then send it back to full council. <laughs> um, so starting at the top um, and at the beginning, and I'll say just um, another sort of introduction here. So I had um, a new person on our staff, new was about a year and a half ago, um, sort of identify these things because it was like fresh eyes on the code and um, helping him sort of learn that, but also identify things that we've just looked at it for so many years that we wouldn't realize. <laughs> um, so there actually, there will be another set of these, but there were so many that we, we broke them down. Um, so the first one is in the um, definitions of family. So um this should be cleaned up to um, be um, less prejudicial. <laughs> so it changes the definition of family to an individual of two or more persons who may or may not be related by blood, marriage, or legal adoption, but living together as a single housekeeping unit. Um, so an individual constitutes a family? Yeah. So if you're in a single family home, but you're living by yourself, it's like you're... You're in a family unit, basically. Yeah. I guess we could have put pets, I suppose. <laughs> um, okay. Any questions on that before I move on? Okay. Oh, and I guess I should ask you, should it, do you want to run through this whole set and then open it for public questions? I public think questions? so. Yeah. Okay. We can note comments and the public can note comments okay. and speak to all of them at once. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. The next one is the table of use in the districts, um, just um, clarifying water supply protection and the the acronym for it, and then that it's mostly a residential district, and then shifting, you know, the location of and and specifying and spelling out central business core, side street, and gateway districts. Just cleaning up that language as we go down on that table. Um, uh, educational use, adding the word overlay, um, and then um, removing the term smart growth overlay district um, because we have it below a sustainable growth, smart growth overlay. It's the same thing. So it's a little bit of a duplication. Um, back in 2017, and then again in 2019, we tried to remove residential incentive 
development overlay and it kept appearing in odd places. So we never apparently took it out of this table. <laughs> so that no longer exists. So that's going. Um, Carolyn, just for consistency, all the other overlay districts are dash O. Should we make the education use overlay EU dash O? Um, do you, do, 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 oh. Uh, that's a good point. Sure. Do you want to group it with the other overlay districts, or does it not really matter where it falls? Um, I don't know that it really matters. Actually, the code people might have an idea about that. So I think they're the ones that typically sort of number everything and format it. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, just I don't have this in Word on my screen. It's just the um, online version. So, so I'm just going to make this note, right? What's wrong with me? I have this here before. Detach. Okay. Be consistent. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Did you know that's why you're on the board? <laughs> okay. So moving along, same section three, um, just um, clarifying, adding the words such as, and then um, defining overlay O districts um, and adding the term attachments. And we got had to get rid of some of these references because they relate to um, sections that aren't there. Um, and then in the definition... Sorry, Carolyn, in the uh, overlay zoning districts paragraph, is the idea there just to open it up so that if future overlay yeah. districts were defined? Okay. Yeah. And then under section 6A, add the required distances for detached accessory structures um, because they're different from um, separation between principal structures. And then under flag lot, section six, um, when we added uh, the allowance for two family by right in every district, um, there was a section in flag lots where it specifically says, as you can see here, that um, flag lots are for single family homes um, in these districts. And so we needed to make sure that it was clear that on a flag lot, you can also have a second unit and that um, we allow flag lots in the WSP district. Then for the, in the sign section, this is just um, deleting a duplication of the same line. And um, for in a character-based districts, and then in signs for um, um, just cleaning up the language about the top of the sign being 15 feet in height above the sidewalk. Um, again, in the sign section, um, clearing up the language about wall signs, um, where they're allowed, um, in the GI districts, that's general industrial, um, and then office industrial, um, this is, um, there is broken into subsections. So between the uh, office industrial and the plan village district. So just cleaning that up. Then going to section eight, off street parking. Um, there was some um, clarification needed for specifying where, which sections you look at for understanding when, the, what parking is required. And then Section 9.3, pre-existing non-conforming uses. Carolyn, can I yeah. ask a question about the parking requirements? Uh -huh. uh, this is very small on my phone, but it says, if not listed in the use table, one space for each unit with a gross living area of 1,000 square feet or smaller and two maximum required for each unit greater than 1,000 square feet. Yeah. Um, what's the maximum about there. So you're not required to provide more than two per unit in any any residential use in the city. So if you have more than a thousand square feet, you need two parking spaces. But if you have four thousand square feet of living space, you don't need four parking spaces. You will always only need two per unit. Okay. And we can't allow anyone to have more than two. 
you right right could we require fewer than two i think that's what's tripping me up Two maximum required sort of reads to me like it we could require fewer than two okay so i'm not sure how to fix that um so it could be and up to two maximum or could it just be two required for each unit greater one than 1000 square feet yeah strike maximum yeah okay Okay. Um, section 9.3 is all about pre or section nine chapter nine, section nine is all about pre-existing non-conformities and um, it can be pretty confusing. So <laughs> this is um, clarifying when um expansions are allowed by right um and just um trying to make it more easily understandable um that um you can do a vertical or a horizontal expansion um that doesn't come closer um to a lot line than the existing nonconformity and therefore doesn't project further into the setback um, and, um, you can do that by right. If you're up to, if you have at least, um, um, you're not projecting more than five feet into the required setback. So you get sort of this, if your structure is already there, there's a little bit of a setback. You can't go six feet in, but you can go five feet. Yeah without having to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. If you're four foot into the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. you're going mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then jumping to Section 10 under Special Permits. Um, so this is just, um, I don't know how this term got in here, but Special Permits are made to the Office of Planning and Sustainability, and then those have to be also stamped in with the city clerk. So it's just... Um, sort of clarifying the order um, and that also acknowledging that we have electronic submission. So this can also be submitted electronically. Who's responsible for getting them in through city clerk? Does that happen from your office? Yeah. First? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and that, well, they, and automatically now in the permit system, it sends to the clerk. So they're notified when something comes in. Section 11 is a site plan review. Um, remove references to the sections that have been removed and clarify the wording. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is all um, just cleaning up the language projects which require a planning board special permit um, and are not otherwise um, projects that would trigger um, a site plan, they still must be accompanied by a site plan. Um, and in such cases, the applicant shall include the site plan materials as part of special permit application and only be required to pay the fee for the special permit application, not the site plan. So the idea is you, the board will always be able to see the site plan, even if the, I mean, if the use is required by special permit, you still want to see the site plan, but it's not a separate, um, you don't pay double um, for the special permit. That sentence says that they must be accompanied by a site plan approval. Should that be site plan application or just site plan? Site plan, yeah. There are situations we don't vote on a site plan. It's just right. And it doesn't happen a lot because many times, you know, a project entails more than 2,000 square feet of new construction, which is a trigger in itself for site plan. Okay. Um, okay. Um, then um, jumping down to 350, 
22, eliminate references to a section that was um, repealed, um, and then just um, add the language as permitted by state statute. We get ourselves in trouble when we reference someone else's code. <laughs> okay, now jumping to attachments. So the rural residential attachment, um, we needed to update and add missing solar uses that were, and this was just an error. It was missed when we went through and redid the tables. So solar uh, photovoltaic of any size on ground mounted or over legal parking is allowed by right. Um, and then there's a bad reference there for flag lots. So that's a modification in the SR table. Similarly, mm -hmm. this was inadvertently left out of the uses allowed by right solar hotel, uh, solar PV array over ground mount uh, over the ground or legal parking lot or driveway. Um, I'm sorry, on the ground over legal parking or the driveway. Um, then in the URB attachment, um, just re locating where the detached accessory structures are um, specified in the dimensional section. So from lot size down to setbacks. And then uh, for some reason, the maximum height for accessory structures was dropped when we added this table just inadvertently. So we want to add that back in. And it's the same for every district, the maximum height for a garage, let's say, as opposed to a principal structure. Mm -hmm. Um, so similarly in the URC table, making those same changes. Um, and then in URC, um, for some reason, rooftop solar and uh, water and, and PV was left out as a use by, as a lab by right. It's not really use, but um, then in the highway business district table, um, this goes back years. Um, so we we were trying to consolidate the uses and make it and simplify it. But then um, because in highway business, oh, almost every kind of commercial use is allowed. Um, but we um, determined that it wasn't clear enough that that also includes auto sales. So we're sort of separating that back out from the lumped in use category for retail um, and for auto repair, um, adding that car wash is considered a repair type of use. So that would be in that category mm -hmm. opposed to a personal service type and of use. Just to clarify, this is highway business. It's not right. gateway. Exactly. Right. Um, and then attachment 24, water supply protection. Um, cleaning up the language here and um, adding the 200 foot depth has always been in there. I think it was in a different location. So we're putting it back up in the, in this, at the table in the front end. Um, and then um, changing the category to new standard lot size as opposed to new lots. Mm -hmm. Um, and then clarifying the setbacks for accessory structures, um, detached or, and attached. Going back to the flag use. Um, and that. A flag lot to standard lot. Yes, exactly. Cause there's another category on the next page for flag lots where the dimensions are different. Um, and then there was an error in the graphic as well, showing a four foot, there's an allowed four foot setback for accessory structures in, in this water supply protection. Um, and then finally, um, this is um, an ordinance um, that is, um, Again, eliminating the references anywhere in the code just to completely make sure we eliminate residential incentive overlay. Um, so it's a direction essentially to the ECODE people that they need to do a deep dive search. But here where we've 
we found them so far in these four different places. So <laughs> just get rid of it. <laughs> and that's it. Wow. Someday AI will take this all over. These massive rewrites. And we won't need yep. any staff. Wow. This is great. It's where the rubber beats the road. The little details. That's what the people came to see. Yeah. <laughs> So, so thanks for walking through that for us. Yep. Thanks, you guys, for being, being detail-oriented, too. Um, so I guess we need a mo. Well, first, we open it up to public comment. Oh. There we go. Is there anyone here in council chambers who would like to speak to these changes in the zoning, um, the editing? Please come forward and state your name and address. Hi, Alex Bowen, Market Street. It was just uh, the off-street parking requirements and the pre-existing pre non-conforming. I still couldn't figure them out just from reading it, and I tend to think I'm a relatively intelligent person who has read a lot of zoning law. So is the two maximum? Could you just explain the, what the two maximum is? Um, that would be helpful. And for the non-conforming structure, the extends at most five feet into the required setback. Is that the existing non-conforming structure extends only five feet? So if it extends six feet already, is that what it was? Sorry, I think you may have said what that was. So, so my understanding is you have a non-conforming structure. So say there's a 10-foot setback from the property line, and this non-conforming structure is extending nine feet into that. So it's one foot off the property line. Okay. What it's trying to say is that um, any addition to that structure can only extend five feet into the setback or be five feet off the property line. It can't extend all the way to the full extent of the nonconformity. Only in this scenario. So that, that's the by right standard. If you wanted to go all the way to one feet off the line, then you go to the zoning board. You can always go. Does that make sense? You can go up to five feet into the setback, whatever the setback is. We don't know because in, in another oh, see. zone, it might be a 20 foot setback. And again, you can only go five feet into that setback. The Even non conforming is already five feet into the setback. No, the existing could be any you amount. Into this. You're saying that anything can go into the setback. That's what I don't understand. No, only if it's an existing non conforming okay. structure. Great. Okay. Right. So that so that's the first yeah. yes. test. Existing non conforming structure. Yes. Right. So whatever that non conformity is, okay. you can only go five feet into the not more than five feet. Even if the existing non conformity is way more than five feet into it. Okay. So you can't, can't make your house line up. Like if, if you were like adding a room. Right, it would have to be opposite. You could make it line up if you go to the zoning board, but this is just the standard for I'm just going straight to the building department and I'm gonna get my permit and I'm already non conforming. But if I can continue that non conformity, so long as I'm not extending further than five feet into the setback, I just go to the building department, get my permit, and I'm ready to go. If I want to go all the way to the existing condition and it's beyond the five feet, then the next paragraph down that's not shown in here because we're not changing it says you go to the zoning board. So let's say I had a non conforming structure and it's five feet into the setback and I want to, and it's, you know, the front setback. I, are you saying that I can build parallel? Mm -hmm. And as long as I don't, so even if I increase the volume that's in the setback, yeah. that's allowed, mm -hmm. I just can't go closer. Mm -hmm. And if you're only two feet into the setback, you can only go exactly. two feet to match it. But you just can't go more than five. And then for the parking, the zoning never requires you to provide more than two spaces per unit is what that's trying to say. But we're removing, the recommendation is to remove the word maximum. So it's just two parking spaces. When, so... The, the zoning never requires you to have three or four or five or 10 per one unit. There's no maximum. Right. There's no maximum unless you go to the table of use and there are some districts that have a maximum. 
and otherwise the maximum would kind of be constrained by the open space on the lot like you can't put more pavement than the open space required you know maximum there so that's kind of another yeah. limit if it's a track for travel is that open not if you're parking on it it sounds like you're just i'm danny mccann it sounds like you're just doing a cleanup here and not thinking through necessarily what's in the regs but i would just kind of highlight that maybe a thousand square feet is not the correct threshold between one and two parking spaces maybe it's more like 1200 square feet or 1250 you know what makes it a thousand you know 1100 square feet is a two-bedroom unit which often not always but often does not have two separate people with separate cars so is our is two the correct number for an 1100 square foot unit Food for thought. Thank you. Other comments about these? You're right, very much housekeeping changes. All right, and I don't think there's anyone out there in the Zoom world who'd like to speak to this at this point. Don't see any hands raised, comments. Um, any other questions for Carolyn about this before we... I would like to go on record and say I like Danny's shirt. Write that for the record, please. I think it's actually an important planning um, issue in the city. So, you know. Um, is there a motion perhaps to close the public hearing? I move to close the public hearing. The public. Public hearing. Second. Motion been made to. to, to close the public comment <laughs> well we're not going to close the public hearing until we vote on it right to give a recommendation no, no no you make your motion after you close the hearing okay thank you thank you sam good good motion the motion has been made close the public hearing was there a second stacy stacy thank you any discussion all those in favor okay so now we just want to uh acknowledge approve recommend these changes onto the city council via the legislative matters committee. So I had three add dash O to the label for educational use. Strike maximum in the parking spaces. Um, and then submit site plan, not submit site plan approval. But So yeah, I think we need to vote on our recommendation. I, I move that we give a positive recommendation to city council with the three edits that Carolyn mentioned. I second. Thanks, motion is made by Chris Tate, seconded by Janet to recommend this to city council with the edits. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Carolyn. And thanks, whoever that anonymous person in your office who kind of flagged all those. That was Nathan. I bet. All right. So now it's 745. Uh, we're going to move into a, a, a preliminary subdivision for 461 feet of new road by Consenji Automotive Realty LP at 17187 King Street. Map ID 24D8081338. Um, and this was continued from uh, September 12th, 24, without opening up the hearing. It's a preliminary subdivision. Uh, the vote is a simple majority of the board, the quorum, and it's a concept plan that bears no weight on the board's determination under a, a future subdivision review. So maybe before you begin your presentation, Carolyn, do you want to add anything about the process or... Um, sure. So this is a continuation from the last meeting because um, the board didn't get a, there wasn't enough time to check out the stakes, which is just a required part of evaluating this concept for a preliminary subdivision. The preliminary subdivision, uh, so subdivision is about creating um, street infrastructure. That's what subdivision re review is. And it's a separate statutory authority from the zoning ordinances. 
And um, however, um, when modifications to a zoning ordinance are um, being considered that might change um, the uses allowed, um, there is a provision in the statutes that allow people to file for a subdivision, go through the preliminary and definitive subdivision review process, um, and then that uh, at uh, the time that you file, your zoning is essentially frozen. The uses allowed are frozen for a period of eight years. Um, so this is in front of you because it is a mechanism allowed um, um, to be used to freeze the um, uses allowed in the zoning district. And so the applicant is availing themselves of that provision because city council um, vote was um, holding public hearings and ultimately voted to approve um, the removal of special permit provision for the for auto sales in the gateway district. So in order to protect that allowed special permit process, the applicant filed subdivision, um, um, submitted a preliminary subdivision, which will then likely be followed on the heels with a definitive subdivision for a street layout. So um, that's what's in front of you. So the the uh, effectively, this is the way that anybody, I mean, zoning changes all the time and you know, there's no guarantee that when you buy a piece of property 15 years later, what you thought you were going to use it for is 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 allowed in that location. But if you know that something's changing, you have this process essentially to vest the property as you, what you intended to use it for for a period of eight years to get yourself the ability to use that. And do I understand correctly that the... um this preliminary uh, hearing tonight has no bearing on our decision for the definitive hearing, but also that the results of that definitive hearing, even if they ultimately came forward with a plan that didn't involve anything that we're seeing as part of this process, that would still be allowed. So yeah. whatever's on paper here is not necessarily what we're going to see later, and that would be fine. It doesn't. Yes, the correct. future project does not have to include what we're seeing. Exactly. Well. All right. Um, any other clarifying questions? Okay. So we have a presentation. Sure. Let me share the screen. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson here uh, on behalf of Cosenzi Automotive Realty Limited Partnership, owner of 171 187 King Street here in Northampton. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Excellent summary. Um, Ms. White, excellent question. Um, I'm happy to get into the, any of those technical details, but I think you understand exactly what we're trying to do here, and it is to free zoning. However, we do understand um, what the, the board is required to look at as far as the preliminary subdivision plan. So somewhat simply, you know, if you can see my mouse, it is a three lot subdivision. It's a five point, I want to say three acre, uh, 5.34 acre parcel of land. Uh, in total, we've got three lots. Uh, lot one, which is down here, is a hundred about 120,000 square feet, 119,345 square feet. Lot two, which is back here, which really can only exist as a result of the creation of this roadway, is 86,691 square feet. And then this proposed lot three, which is tucked up here, is 12,459 square feet. The roadway area. Uh, in its entirety is about 14,495 square feet. And it looks like uh, from about this area here, the, the intersection uh, on King Street to the back is about 175 feet deep. We've got a radius of, I believe it's about 61.5 feet for the um, cul-de-sac. If you were out on the site, you should have seen some orange stakes and some orange markings on the ground. Um, I mean, there's no real magic to this. And what we've got here, we've we've met the subdivision control law standards for what we've got to provide on this preliminary plan. We've got some drip, proposed drainage areas uh, here. And then towards the back here, we're showing easements that exist. We're also showing the topography. We've got the name 
I'm not going to belabor it, et cetera. Yep. Uh, I've been talking with Carolyn, obviously, about the definitive subdivision plan submission requirements. You'll get a much more refined plan. That's typically how it is. You know, looking behind the curtain, a preliminary subdivision plan is much simpler to prepare, doesn't have the lift of engineering, diligence, et cetera, that a definitive plan has. So when that definitive plan comes back within the next couple of months, I think we've got a deadline of um, late, November, mid to late November is, I think, when you'll get it. It'll be more refined. It's still just the idea to get that eight-year zoning freeze to to protect the uses that were in existence at the time of the filing of the preliminary plan. So just to be transparent about what we're looking to do. Obviously, happy to answer any questions that you have, but it's pretty simple. Often the DPW works through all of these calculations and designs. Do they bother at this point? Take a look at this. Um, you know, again, sort of concept layout. And so preliminary is, I mean, sometimes when you, the board, especially as it relates to residential subdivisions, it's in, um, there are certain criteria about showing what the different, um, feasibility is for one layout versus another layout at the concept preliminary phase, but that's different for a commercial subdivision. Um, and then like um, Mr. Reedy um, noted, the definitive subdivision requires all the detail, all the engineering. And so that's the point at which DPW would be evaluating it. Um, even though this is just to get the freeze, you have to think of it as though somebody could take these plans, deliver them to the registry of deeds and pull up, you know, start building a subdivision. So. Thanks. Yeah. And then I'll just add um, for some of you, George, you may have been on the board in your first stint where on King street, again, the same process was used up at where we now have where um, um, Aldi and the Bay State Medical um, building was. So once upon, actually your firm did this <laughs> um, way back when um, that property was lying, you know, undeveloped for such a long time. And the same, um, the city also um, modified the zoning during that process. And so the owner then filed um, sub subdivision plans to um, freeze the zoning. So it's happened before. Questions from the board? My my only um, observation from the site walk, I, I was out there today. It's all very well marked out. Yep. Um, it seems like the 30, I believe it's a 30 foot width uh, where it meets King Street right there. Yep. And I was just curious why you chose that width it seems like the the new curbing that was just put in when all of this was was modified very recently appears to be about 28 feet if the spray paint's 30 feet. So I'm wondering why you're, you'd want to rip up the curbing and, and make it wider there. Yeah, and I uh, without a definitive answer, my guess would be a result of a review of the subdivision rules and regulations for the city of Northampton and whether there is a minimum width required for certain types of streets. That's how it typically is in municipalities. So that would be my guess so that we didn't have to ask for a waiver from 30 down to 28 if the board would entertain a waiver. And again, it's one of those uh, mental exercises where we're saying, hey, we're not going to build it. And so this is why we're trying to a show on paper without waivers because we yeah. don't expect to build it. The board is looking at it to say, well, you may, if when we come back with our definitive, if you'd prefer we reduce it to 28 and request a waiver to that end, we're happy to do that. I think it was just a function of looking at what your regulations provide. Okay. I think I personally have to look at it like you're building this. Sure. I, I completely agree. Yeah. Great. We'll open it up to the public at this point. Thank you. Anybody would like to speak um, about this application for preliminary? Please. Hi, my name is Maureen Bowler. I'm from 165 Glendale Road. 
all the other way out of town. So <laughs> um, never been to any of these meetings before. Um, just have been a participant via the Gazette because I'm not an online person, as Carolyn now knows. Um, so uh, thank you for letting me know about posting the get where to find the agenda and all that information. So I've lived in this town my whole life. I'm familiar with that property being, being dealerships. I think years ago it was one, and another decade after that it was another. And it's been an eyesore for another decade or more now. Um, so I don't know Carla. I don't know if I'm saying her, her name properly, Kazenzi. I just know that if you go by her other businesses in town, they all seem to be pretty well maintained. They look good from the street. The sidewalks are maintained. There's trees growing out front, benches, the whole nine yards. And what I find more importantly is she's very active with the community. Um, I'm part of the Rotary Club, and we got to crash into one of her dealerships last winter, and we had our Festival of the Trees because we had no place else to put them. She's active in the Chamber of Commerce, and she, you see her name for participating in all sorts of nonprofit auctions and such. So I hope this city and everybody involved, and it sounds like you are, on board are doing everything you can to work with her um, to get this done and to have things looking a little bit better in that area. Um, one thing I would like to say, because you did mention the DPW, I drive by there, I didn't walk by there. How come it's not maintained the since the new curbing went in? Is it because they're pollinators and we no longer maintain the the sidewalk all down. Yeah, I'm happy to, to speak to that. I'm glad you noticed that. It's basically the DPW, unfortunately, doesn't have the staffing to do that at this point. Um, it's, it was very nice when the DOT did the strip there, um, but they just aren't able to manage the upkeep. They're trying to look for a solution to do that. Hopefully down the road, if somebody does develop that lot, they may take that on to keep that looking more. Well, she seems to maintain her other properties like that. So I can imagine what her tax bills are, what her water bills are, what I call the rainwater tax bill, I can imagine. So I really hope, I mean, this city prides itself on on um, supporting women and, and entrepreneurs and such. And she's kind of in my book. I, like I said, I don't know her, she doesn't know me, but I look at her as kind of being like the gold star. So I would hope that we're all doing what we can to get this done and uh, have things looking better. And, and, you know, I think it'd be good for everybody. So thank you very thank you. much. Anyone else? Hello, everyone. I'm Benjamin Spencer. I live on Rust Avenue. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, after um, what we heard at last uh, the last uh, meeting, I just thought that um, Carolyn's job of what she described tonight uh, about the process and how this filing of the preliminary subdivision plan um, you know, um, freezes the zoning um, for the applicant under what they had purchased the property under in the gateway district and all of the form-based code that comes with it, you know, that, that gets frozen for up to eight years. So at the last meeting on a couple of occasions, both from the applicant and from a planning board member, some uh, words were said that sort of fly in the face of that. And I think it's important that it's made crystal clear what exactly we're talking about when we're talking about this property and the gateway district and the zoning change. So I really appreciated the comments tonight that clarified that the Casenzi Auto Group provided they do what they're here to do tonight and everything goes according to plan, absolutely have the same opportunity that they have had all along. And I wish the Gazette reporter was here because the article that was about last meeting contained a quote that I felt was not necessarily a great quote. And then that quote has resulted in two letters to the editor that ran in the Gazette that I didn't feel um, contributed to the um, 
um, to the conversation in a way that was, you know, accurate. So I appreciate everybody's work to keep all this clear and accurate. Thank you. Um, and any other person who would like to speak regarding this preliminary plan? Yeah, I don't see anybody out on the Zoom world who would like to comment at this point. Thanks, buddy. Um, so at this point, we'll turn it back to the board. Any more questions regarding what's been submitted here? Hmm. Carolyn, procedurally, as a, is this still an approval or a denial, or what's the what's the vote? Um, it's up to the board, but you could approve it or deny it. If you denied it, it doesn't prevent them from filing a definitive subdivision. But you'd want to specify why you would be denying it. Um, and approval again, um, it's good to have guidance if there are things like you know, um the board may be willing to entertain a dimensional um, reduction in the subdivision standards for the width of road to match the driveway opening, something of that sort. You could certainly identify that as a, as an opportunity, um, but otherwise, you know, your decision here doesn't um, um dictate one way or the other how the board will have to weigh in when the definitive is submitted because that's when you're really looking at all the detailed um, engineering evaluation and and so you have to make sure that those um, standards are met and um, subdivision is very specific um, and if an applicant meets all the criteria in the subdivision rules um, the board is obligated to approve a subdivision So our, uh, I just want to make sure this is so weird procedurally, <laughs> make sure I understand what I'm voting on. So an approval tonight would not, they could not go and pull a permit. They would still have to come forward with the definitive. And so an approval just says, conceptually, we approve that this meets the requirements and they still, or doesn't meet the requirements in a denial and specify why, and then they still come forward with a definitive. Right. And here's an example of some things that you might, and the board hasn't talked about this. Let me just throwing out examples. So let's say the board felt like conceptually, this was the wrong way to lay out the parcel. Maybe a, a hammerhead was more appropriate um, subdivision um, street layout, or maybe a loop street through the property. So you have one, you know, one way loop through and so you could make that comment in your either approval or denial so that it gives direction to the applicant about what they should be preparing in their definitive um and but there's no obligation to do that but it's just sort of you know you um the board has done this on various other subdivisions to say well you know um a cul-de-sac eats up uh, you know requires too much pavement you should put a hammerhead instead or something like that And the, and the loop would provide for another access or uh, ingress on King Street right. rather than channeling all into one area. Right. Um, and cut up a new cycle track and sidewalk. Yeah. <laughs> if, right. if denied, would the same time period, like they would have to submit within, yeah. is it, what was it, nine months? Uh, nine months, uh, seven, uh, months seven months, seven. I think. Yeah, seven months. So it, even if it's denied, they don't have to come back for a preliminary. They can go right to definitive. Uh -huh. Yeah. But if there were, if you were denying it, it's helpful for the applicant to know why. Yeah. Why, why do we need to, I mean, the 30. Why would we need to um, make a comment about the 30 versus the 28? I mean, if they, they would have to change the, if they wanted to, to make it 30, they'd have to come back regardless. And Right. It's more just giving guidance to say. Instructive. Yeah. The layout, because right. I, I just didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and I want to be clear. So the sub the definitive subdivision comes through, and just for an example, the 
the this uh, circle works. Um, each one of the parcels still has to submit a site plan. Right. What they want to build there. It's not mm -hmm. like it's the only look at this. Right. They're not going to be talking about buildings or elevations or. It's just about access. the utilities and the street. It's about the utilities, the movement of cars in and out. Mm -hmm. and, yep. Mr. Chair, if I could, just one response to one of the uh, um, public comments as far as that the Casenzis are in no different place now than they would have been. And uh, I mean, what I just would like to mention is I'm here tonight. I was here before. I'm going to be here again. The engineers have done this plan. They're going to have to do a tremendous amount of diligence. And so there is significant expense that the Casenzis will have to bear in order to get to that place where they were before. So just if we're talking about the whole picture, I think it's important to talk about the whole picture. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, did we did we close the public hearing? Did we close public comment? Mm -hmm. Any more clarifying questions for Carolyn? A public comment is still open. I just had a question about the shape. Was there any reason for the triangles and who owns this middle of the circle? That's so I'd like to show, but uh, the computer rebooted as I was up here. So I'll just talk through it. Yeah. Um, so through the chair, it's all owned by Casenzi. Uh, if it were to be developed, um, it would likely have the city, and we would try to get the city to take control of that roadway as a public way. And then whether the city said yes or no, and then there was some sort of covenant or association of the owners of those lots, they may have the responsibility to take care of the center of that cul-de-sac. Uh, when I look at subdivisions, especially in this context, one of the things that we want to do is to make sure that we're, because as Carolyn had mentioned, really what we're doing is creating a new building lot from something that couldn't have been created before because it didn't have frontage. Otherwise, we would have been here in an ANR approval not required plan because it all had frontage. So the shape of the lots that are created are really a function of that. And um, typically municipalities charge more per lot that you create. And so what you're trying to do is not create too many, but create enough so that you are in fact only creating uh, a lot that could exist because of the existence of that subdivision roadway. So no magic in it really yep. besides that. But in the in the next iteration, they could come through with a hammerhead and have more lots coming off that than just three. They would have enough frontage for perhaps four or five lots if the, the street extended all the way back to the back property. So just so we're clear, this isn't there's there's a chance that this won't just be three lots. It might even be just, you know, two lots. Who's to say? Close the public comment. I move to close the public comment. Second. Motion is made to close the public comment by Chris Tate, seconded by Sam Taylor. Thank you. Any discussion? Because I don't think we want to continue it. So. All those in favor? Those in public comment? All right. Thank you. Um, I do think there are some deficiencies on the plan. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Unfortunately, I'm just on my phone, unfortunately. Um, but I think there are some requirements that weren't met. And I know everyone's saying it doesn't matter, but I would, my druthers would be to um, deny it based on um, some requirements that haven't been met, but. What requirements haven't been met? Well, I'm reading through the subdivision regulations and there's some, you know, I'm not gonna count the developers are encouraged 
ones here. There's some squishy language in here, so we'll, we'll stay away from developers are encouraged. Um, you know, I don't really see a lot about stormwater. There's just like little rectangles saying stormwater here. Um, a lot of times city streets are going to have catch basins in the street and there's just like no drainage infrastructure shown whatsoever. Um, it also talks about showing proposed contour lines. So the existing are shown, but I didn't see proposed on here. And without being able to tell the grades that are proposed, I don't know if this is meeting the um, street grade requirements or not. And depending on what the grades are, it may have the cul-de-sac itself may have to extend further into the lot or not. I just have no way of knowing that. Um, but aren't they going to do that with the, I mean, this is just a, we're, we're okaying it, and then they're going to come with an actual I, I think it doesn't matter if we okay it or don't okay it. They'll still come with an actual plan. I'm just looking at the requirements for this plan, and there are some requirements that haven't been met on this plan. You know, these, does it say, Chris, in those regs that it's a requirement for a prelim preliminary submittal to, or is that for the... the... Yeah, I'm under <laughs> Article V, Article 5, Preliminary Plans, Submission to the Board of Health and Planning Board, Submission of Plans and Forms, and then I'm in Section 290-18, Contents of Plan. So I'm in the preliminary plan. Yep. Um, requirements um so there's there's some other things there aren't that many requirements um but there are some that aren't on this plan so so for me i you know i would be inclined to uh i don't know i don't even know what the vote is but to to vote to deny the deny application it. deny or accept it yeah or but just because it's missing, it's missing some helpful information. I think it's also just showing the uh, the property lines, and it's not showing. I don't know what it's showing actually. I I can't tell like where the proposed pavement would be, and like obviously we're seeing the the property, the proposed property lines, and then there's like striping in the middle of it, but there's no pavement. So I'm just very confused about the whole thing. So if this is supposed to be a, a street that the city takes over and maintains, there's not even like extensive pavement. So I don't even know how wide the street is. I just know that the right of way is 24 feet wide, but I don't know how wide the, the, the in, street is. Internal street is, yeah. yeah. And the right of way, I think is um, supposed to be 70 feet wide. And then for a commercial, um, the right of way layout, not the paved way portion. Right, so it's only 30 feet at the, so one thing you could do is either um, discuss a denial and the reasons that there's not enough information based on what the plan contents were supposed to contain. Um, alternatively, um, you could um, deny it or approve it and make a statement that um, the decision is not does not grant any waivers from the required elements of submittal. And that sort of captures everything so that they, because typically there's not a lot of detailed engineering anyway that's done at this um, phase. Um, and so, and so you can make any combination, I guess is what I'm saying of either denial or approval, but I think it would be important to specify that no, um, that you're not voting to allow any waivers of the requirements for both submittal and um, meeting the standards for the subdivision um, review process. I I would vote to support it with the with that caveat because I just don't think at this point there's I mean the costs of, of all this are extreme and we're so we're so far from uh from an actual plan that is gonna have to come in front of us no matter what uh that requiring uh, those types of details, which are then going to just literally have to be redone when they actually put a plan in place, uh, doesn't that just seems like 
a massive cost for I don't I don't see the gain. Well, I don't think they would ever come back to us with another preliminary plan. They would come back to us with the definitive right. plan. So it doesn't no matter how we vote, there still it doesn't change anything. Well, I I guess I mean, you know how I I felt in my I guess my quote with this I feel like we've just played continued to play politics with with something that didn't ever need to get to this point and um you know this is something simple it is a answer to um a place that we shouldn't be in to begin with yep. um so yeah Chris um so I, you know I I appreciate the homework you did and uh the the care that you want us to take in terms of the criteria for preliminary but for me it's really just the concept of they're going to subdivide this lot this is maybe what it's going to look like um, um i don't expect all of those details either um and i it's really an acceptance that this is a legal maneuver more than anything um and i and in that sense i just want to say that why take up the board with a lot more um inspection and review of a plan like this when it's really just put forward as a concept to kind of set their set their part in the process um we will see something later on it's going to be much more definitive and then then we'll really get to go over it as will the dpw who will spend much more time than we you know going through those kind of things um but i i respect that you want to perhaps deny it because they didn't do their due diligence in coming through to us but uh, they didn't do that in our previous hearing either i get it but i would much rather uh, i think move forward and and approve the plan understanding that as carolyn mentioned that we're not um accepting any kind of waivers or acknowledging any kind of waivers of the, all those regulations but jen and stacy i'm not sure how you feel Do we need to even if we approve it put any of those caveats in i mean it's just assumed that they're going to have to meet all the other yeah i mean i think it's helpful to know that you know just a state that your the approval doesn't um has no bearing on any waiver requests or um is not a statement of waiving any of the regulations i guess you don't have to i just think um, given that there this there's scant information on this, it might be helpful. I think to to build the plan that is shown would require a bunch of waivers. It sounds like a seventy foot right of way is required, and they're showing a thirty foot right of way. So yep. right there, that's if you don't state that you're we're not allowing that waiver, then it could be implied that you are. So I'm not I. You know, I don't want to make applicants jump through unnecessary hoops just for these sort of, just for the sake of it. But I'm also very aware that we do need to look at the plans as though they could become real because technically they could. And we're now seeing for a second time that the applicant has presented plans that we're not able to fully evaluate the first time because of issues with, you know, the way that the site was set up. And now because the plans aren't fully meeting the requirements. So, and I don't think that a denial is going to change the next step in the process. They're still going to come forward with a fully detailed plan set, but I hope that it would communicate the message that we're taking our due diligence seriously, because as we've already seen, plans can change. And one thing that somebody says they're going to do later is not what they're going to do. And so who knows? So I, I think yeah, I need to look at this as though this could very well happen, even if today it doesn't sound like it will. So I think I'm with Chris that I feel more comfortable with a denial, not to try to create some unnecessary work, but because I don't have enough information on which to base an approval. Good. Why don't we just vote on it? Would you, Chris, like to make a motion? <laughs> I think those are really legitimate, you know, arguments. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think I'm leaning with Chris and Jana, but I think I think we do need to give some feedback on what we would expect um, the applicant to, like with a denial, you know, what we'd expect in the next. Um, and well, I guess that's 
I, don't, I mean, I guess the denial doesn't change what's going to come to us next anyway. So but I, I guess I'm a little confused. So you you would want them to come up with a full plan. Is that what you're, you're saying? That's what no. the definitive yeah. plan is going to be that they're coming back. Yes, I understand with. that. But like, why are we making them go through this? process we're not asking them to go through any process after this we're just it's more of a principle than anything else we're not yeah. asking them to come back with another preliminary plan we're just ask we're just letting them know that and them and future applicants if we ever in this place again that if you come to us with a preliminary plan you need to cross your t's and dot your i's and you know with your submissions that's all i think it's what we're saying well i guess i'm i'm sorry i don't understand the dotting and I's and crossing T's. Uh, dotting I's and crossing T's seems like a definitive plan, which is a huge I'm, project. No, just reading the requirements for the preliminary plan. Yeah. So if you don't meet the requirements for a preliminary plan, it's hard for me to approve the preliminary plan. plan. Yeah. And the requ that's just me personally. Right. Yeah, no, it's fine. And the criteria for the 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 next plan is are going to be even more rigid and strict. Um, so, it, it honestly just seems like an exhausting level that we're imposing upon a, a company. No, we're just we're just making a, at a point in time. We're just saying something here, saying we're not asking him to do any more work that he's not going to do anyhow. We're just saying yeah, this is I, where we are tonight. But it's a statement of our of how our city works, and and that we have moved in a direction which is grossly anti business for for because we don't <clears throat> like something there when someone else could have bought it and turned it into a zoo if they wanted to. But that didn't happen. And now we're in this place because someone chose to, to impose a, a rule change on something. And in the past, we have okayed, the, uh, okayed this, the, these things. No, we, we've never been in this. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. I mean, we did. So, uh, and if that's what we have done in the past, consistency matters. Like people don't come and and try to build in a city where there's not consistency. And instead, we have moved in a direction where we've changed the rules, and then we're not being consistent. Because it sounds like we don't like the idea of a car dealership. No, I'm not. No, Sam. Please don't make that general statement. I just did make. It. Okay. Okay. You then you can say that, uh, okay. but don't yeah. speak for the board or the city. I am speaking directly for myself okay. as a member of the board. May I? May I suggest that we make a motion and we try to move this forward? And I can't make a motion. I don't think. Although I'd have to look at Robert Tools of Borders. It sounds like the the motion that's on the on the board is to reject the proposal at whatever King. What's what's the address here? One seventy one King Street for preliminary subdivision. Sam, was that you making a motion or? Well, I, I, mean, think I, was, I don't think yeah. I got a motion. If, I don't think I heard a motion on the table yet. Trying to oh, move I need a motion and a second yeah. for whatever. Someone. So Sam has made a motion to deny the preliminary application for a subdivision at 171 King Street. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Motion made by Sam Taylor, seconded by Chris Tate. Any more discussion? Well, it sounds like it would be helpful for the applicant to provide for us to provide some feedback for why we might deny this if carolyn needs to include it in the motion and in the uh minutes yeah do you want to add a few things so i think for me there is the the right of way wasn't consistent with the commercial standard for a commercial subdivision and uh there weren't any proposed uh contour lines on the plan 
So both of these um, would change the, the shape and the area of the lots proposed. Thank you. I can't think of any others. Motion's been made and seconded. Any other discussion, Carolyn, anything else that came up? And again, I, we could add that language that even this denial does that. Um, we will look at the next iteration of their plan. Um, I think I got a comment, and I don't know if you want to add it, just generally that there wasn't enough information in the submittal to approve the plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Motions were made and second. All those in favor? Okay. All those opposed? Four to one. Thanks for coming again tonight. Thanks. Good we'll seeing see you. you down the road. Yeah. See you in a couple months. Okay. Thank you, folks out in Zoom and in City Council Chambers for joining us. I think we just have a set of minutes to approved now minutes and i revised the agenda and added one more thing uh, uh oh <laughs> all right <laughs> um so yeah minutes from where are we september 12th yeah okay. yep i move to approve the minutes of september 12th second which could be seconded any discussion all those in favor unanimous and then the only other item was um Chris Tate's term as a planning board rep at CPC is up. And so they need, um, so you all need to vote whether you want Chris to continue or if there's someone else that might want to do it. And they need that. They're about to start a new round. So we need to. I'm happy to step aside if anyone wants to. Are you happy, <laughs> are you happy to serve again? Happy to have you serve again. I'm okay to serve again if I have to. <laughs> I choose not to run, but I'll do it. <laughs> okay. I think you've done a great job, Chris. Oh, it's all wow. by Zoom, right? It Still? Is. Yeah. It's all by Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for representing us. And, I, and the planning board does play a good role in those meetings, for sure. So do we have to make a vote? Aha. Uh -huh. I move to... Um... Reappoint Chris as the planning board rep on the CPC. Is this a one year term? For a seven <laughs> lifetime term. Uh, for the required term. For the required term. The Community Preservation Committee. Okay. Um, any discussion on? Oh, the motion needs to be seconded. I'll second. Seconded by Stacy. Um, any discussion? All right. All those in favor? <laughs> so I'll, okay. I'll bring up ours. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you for doing that. Um, David Whitehill was our rep to the PVPC, the planning. Oh, uh, right. You were? Pioneer Valley. Pioneer Valley. Oh, okay. I caught yeah. that. So he must have passed that torch. Because um, I think he was for a while before you came. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's hard to get to those meetings though, because they're right before these. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they're having a big their annual uh, over across the river at the what they call something else now. It used to be a big the restaurant, boat. Still, big uh, rest the boat yard, the boathouse. Uh, yeah, on the um, oh, Okay, I'm just I just wanted to clarify that we still have a member, and I know it's hard to get to those, but everybody's welcome to attend that if you want some taste of hors d'oeuvres and an overview of what's happening in the Pioneer Valley. They would yeah, it's at the um, here I have it. It's at the boathouse October 10th at five o'clock. Yep, and the Seven public's the invited area. also. Do you want to see what they're doing on a regional scale? The more the merrier. You got an RSVP there, Stacey. Yes, but it's right before the planning board. Yeah, it's going to be a bus load coming. We all put it up on our reserves and come to plan <laughs> with the mayor. <laughs> is, is there going to be a bus load? No, I just <laughs> wise guys. Um, any other business to come before the board? All right, motion to adjourn at eight thirty-six. So moved. All those in favor? I second. <laughs> all right, unanimous. Okay.